Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India In this lecture we will consider concepts about oxygen diffusion in the lung to place the topic in perspective respiratory physiology is discussed under these headings we've completed a discussion on these two phenomena and currently we are looking at oxygen diffusion in the lung remember this mnemonic we saw that hypoxia arterial hypoxia can occur in ventilation impairment atmospheric hypoxia diffusion impairment and extrapulmonary shunt learning about oxygen diffusion in the lung will help us understand what happens in diffusion impairment better if this is an alveolus and that is the capillary around the alveolus there is extracellular matrix in between the alveolar epithelium and the capillary endothelium in many places this extracellular matrix is very thin in fact it looks as if capillary endothelium and alveolar epithelium share a common basement membrane this indeed is the respiratory membrane across which both gases have to diffuse oxygen has to diffuse from alveolus into the capillary and carbon dioxide in the reverse direction so these are the layers of the respiratory membrane alveolar epithelium interstitium and capillary endothelium to understand what these capillaries are arranged like it's a network of capillaries in which the alveolus sits here is an electron micrograph which shows the capillary network this is a large vessel here the vessels have been injected with a plastic material everything else has been digested out and uh, and then an electron microscopic picture has been taken those are the credits here the this is the space that will be occupied by the alveolus otherwise you see a network of capillaries around the alveolus you will find more pictures like this on the internet or in your textbooks what you need to understand is that there is a very rich capillary network surrounding each alveolus now we will use this cartoon to depict the compartments across which diffusion of oxygen takes place now let this be the respiratory membrane this is the alveolar compartment and this is the capillary compartment diffusion of oxygen has to happen from alveolus into the capillary let us look at the determinants of diffusion oxygen diffusion is governed by fick's law of diffusion as for any gas the law states that flux of a gas across a diffusion barrier is dependent on the pressure gradient for the gas in the compartments on either sides of the barrier it also depends on solubility of the gas in the medium the medium here is the respiratory membrane and the molecular weight of the gas the other determinant is area of the membrane across which diffusion happens and thickness of the membrane these determinants have a direct relationship with diffusion and diffusion is inversely proportional to molecular weight and thickness of the membrane when we write an equation for flux this is how it looks the pressure gradient or the difference in concentrations of the gas on either sides of the membrane into solubility by root of molecular weight into area of the membrane by thickness of the membrane this can be written out as the diffusion coefficient for the gas and that is a simpler equation for flux to begin with let us say these are the gas concentrations represented by the partial pressures of oxygen on either sides if diffusion had to happen as time goes the pressures on either sides will equalize and diffusion will stop if diffusion has to continue throughout then there must be a way of maintaining p1 at a higher level and that happens with ventilation bringing in of fresh atmospheric air into the alveolus likewise if 
capillary oxygen should not rise too high because that is going to affect diffusion as well. Diffusion will stop if capillary oxygen reaches alveolar oxygen. So, there must be a way of keeping P2 at a low level and that happens with perfusion. So, only if ventilation and perfusion are normal, P1 can be maintained at a high value and P2 can be maintained at a low value and diffusion can continue throughout. Therefore, we already have that for effective diffusion to occur, there must be good ventilation and good perfusion. Flux is dependent on alveolar concentration of oxygen represented by its partial pressure, capillary concentration of oxygen, the diffusion coefficient of the gas which is a constant for oxygen. These are variables, area and thickness of the respiratory membrane will also affect diffusion. And where does ventilation come in? Ventilation maintains alveolar partial pressure at a high value. Where does perfusion come in? Perfusion maintains capillary partial pressure at a low value. Therefore, for effective oxygen transfer, you need a good ventilation, good perfusion and effective diffusion. Diffusion is affected by properties of the diffusion membrane. So, volume of oxygen transferred per unit time across the respiratory membrane <coughs> is dependent on all these three phenomena. I have just inverted the compartments now. We have the respiratory membrane here. Let us think of this as the alveolar compartment and this as the capillary. Normally, the duration for which blood exists in the capillary, a given unit of blood exists in the capillary is about 1 second. Let us say heart rate is at 60 beats per minute. So, for every beat, the duration is 1 second and that volume of blood from that beat will remain in the capillary. So, traverse the capillaries in 1 second. In this cartoon, this is the pulmonary artery which has deoxygenated blood and that is the pulmonary vein having oxygenated blood. And we are allowing for a heart rate of 60 per minute where the dwell time of blood in the capillary is at 1 second. Let this height represent partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus. Normally, it is 100 millimeter mercury. Let us represent that line here. So, this is just indicative of what the alveolar partial pressure is. Venous blood, systemic venous blood which goes into the pulmonary artery and reaches the pulmonary capillary. I have called it PVO2 here. This V is for systemic venous blood which is what travels in the pulmonary artery. The partial pressure of oxygen here is 40 millimeter mercury and that is the blood that enters the capillary. What we now have to understand is that oxygen diffusion happens only for a short while during the entire dwell time of blood in the capillary because in less than a quarter of the time that it travels through the capillary that is by about 0.25 seconds if that represents half a second and that represents quarter second. By quarter of a second, if diffusion is normal, partial pressure of oxygen in the capillary has already reached the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus and no further diffusion will occur. This is a kind of reserve that we have that even in diffusion impairment, the blood that goes out is fully loaded with oxygen. Remember, how saturated hemoglobin is with oxygen depends on the partial pressure of dissolved oxygen. Even though the dwell time of blood in the capillaries is 1 second, effective diffusion of oxygen happens only in the first quarter and then diffusion will cease because capillary partial pressure of oxygen has already reached the alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. The arterial blood will have a slightly less oxygen partial pressure than the alveolus and this small difference there is what we call alveolar 
arterial oxygen difference. The difference is in the partial pressures of oxygen. Are these the only three factors affecting oxygen transfer? Let us see it in the context of the mnemonic we know. Ventilation can affect oxygen transfer. Remember, these are causes of tissue hypoxia. Arterial hypoxia is one of them and arterial hypoxia has these four causes. Ventilation impairment can cause arterial hypoxia because P1 will be less and therefore the level to which P2, P2 can increase will be less. Diffusion impairment can cause arterial hypoxia even if you have an adequate P1 transfer may not be efficient. That is where perfusion comes in. We called it stagnant hypoxia. If perfusion is impaired, blood remains for a longer time in the capillary. By then P2 would have already reached P1 and diffusion would have stopped. So, there is no use of blood remaining in the capillary for that longer time and the amount of blood coming in per unit time will be less and therefore, the amount of oxygen carried out per unit time will be less. That is how we considered stagnant hypoxia because blood remains for a longer time. There is enough time for P2 to rise to P1 levels and therefore, there is no arterial hypoxia in this condition. Whereas, in ventilation impairment and diffusion impairment, there is arterial hypoxia. How then do we think of atmospheric hypoxia? Which of these determinants does atmospheric hypoxia affect? Naturally, P1. If there is atmospheric hypoxia, there will be alveolar hypoxia. How do we think of anemia, a reduction in hemoglobin concentration? Which of these factors does that affect? Now, hemoglobin is a sink for oxygen. From the dissolved oxygen, hemoglobin just soaks up oxygen. Therefore, it serves to keep P2 at a lower level for longer than otherwise. Therefore, there are two determinants of P2 or capillary oxygen, perfusion and hemoglobin concentration. If hemoglobin concentration is low as in anemia, P2 will rise to P1 levels quicker than otherwise. If hemoglobin is there, it is a sink for oxygen in the capillary and therefore will keep dissolved oxygen concentration low enough so that continued diffusion can occur. Anemia reduces effective oxygen transfer because P2 is not kept low enough during the period for which blood dwells in the capillary. In anemic and stagnant hypoxia, arterial PO2, which is the level to which this will rise when blood stays in the capillary compartment, is normal. Therefore, there is no arterial hypoxia, but the amount of oxygen carried in hemoglobin is less in these two conditions. That is why, though there is tissue hypoxia, you find that arterial partial pressures of oxygen, that is dissolved oxygen concentration is normal in these two conditions. Only when dissolved oxygen concentration is low, we refer to that condition as hypoxic hypoxia or arterial hypoxia and these were the causes listed for arterial hypoxia, ventilation impairment, atmospheric hypoxia and diffusion impairment. Let us now consider diffusion impairment. So, here we are again taking a heart rate of 60 per minute allowing for a dwell time of a certain unit of blood in the pulmonary capillary as one second because the heart rate is 60 per minute. When there is diffusion impairment, what you notice is that it may take longer for capillary oxygen to reach alveolar oxygen levels. So, that line represents what the alveolar oxygen PO2 is. So, it may take longer to reach alveolar oxygen, but the blood that 
comes into the pulmonary vein or the systemic artery may be fully oxygenated. Compare this with the earlier scenario. In the normal case, it took only 0.25 seconds for capillary oxygen to reach alveolar oxygen levels. In diffusion impairment, it might have taken longer, but the blood that actually comes out may be fully oxygenated. So, we are looking at two things, arterial PO2, which could be normal in moderate cases of diffusion impairment and the other parameter is alveolar arterial oxygen difference, the difference in partial pressures. That could also be normal in moderate cases of diffusion impairment and therefore, it is not a very good test. If alveolar arterial oxygen difference is more or if PaO2 is less, we already know that there is significant diffusion impairment. In mild to moderate cases of diffusion impairment, these two parameters can be normal. So, PaO2 and AaO2 gradient as some books call it can be normal in mild to moderate diffusion impairment. Now, let us take severe diffusion impairment. Here, even though the dwell time of blood in the capillary is one whole second allowing for a heart rate of 60 again, the diffusion impairment is so severe that the capillary oxygen does not build up to alveolar oxygen levels even by the time that it has to move out of the pulmonary capillary or arterial oxygen concentration or PaO2 arterial partial pressure of arterial oxygen is significantly lower than normal and the alveolar arterial oxygen difference is increased. This indicates that there is severe diffusion impairment. The next question is, if AaO2 difference is worsening in somebody, do we think that diffusion impairment is progressing? For example, from that level, if it is increased further, does it mean that diffusion has worsened? Say, the thickness of the diffusion membrane has increased because of more interstitial edema. Is that what we should conclude if from a previous level of AaO2 difference, the difference is increased or PO2 has decreased? Can we conclude that diffusion has worsened? Not really because in addition to diffusion, there is one other factor which affects AaO2 difference or the level to which arterial oxygen can reach and that factor is the speed of blood flow. Here we have allowed for one second dwell time at a heart rate of 60 per minute. Let us say the heart rate has doubled to 120 per minute. The dwell time for blood in the pulmonary capillary is only 0.5 seconds. What would happen now? So, this is 0.5 seconds and by the time blood has to move out of the capillary because it is flowing faster, because of diffusion impairment, already existing diffu diffusion impairment, you see that the level of arterial oxygen is far less than what it was in this case. When blood flow was slower, arterial oxygen was slightly higher, but when blood flow is faster, arterial oxygen is even less. What we need to understand now is that though in the intensive care unit, the best test for assessing diffusion impairment is the difference between the partial pressures of oxygen between the alveolus and artery partial pressure. So, the difference between these two is taken as an index of diffusion impairment generally, but it is not the best because we have seen just now that moderate degrees of diffusion impairment will not affect either arterial oxygen concentration or AaO2 difference.
And then the degree of AaO2 difference does not indicate just how much diffusion impairment there is because in that patient for some reason if blood flow increases, velocity of flow increases, cardiac output increases, then the duration for which blood exists in the pulmonary capillary will be less and therefore due to the existing diffusion impairment already, there is less time available for oxygen to diffuse and arterial oxygen to reach alveolar oxygen levels. Blood moves out quickly and that could be one reason why alveolar arterial oxygen difference is higher in a patient suddenly. It need not indicate worsening of diffusion impairment. So, though this is the most practical test in the intensive care unit, alveolar arterial oxygen difference as a test of diffusion impairment, it is not the best. Do we have a better test that is sensitive to diffusion impairment even early on, that is even in early stages of diffusion impairment and that is not affected by blood flow not affected by velocity of blood flow or cardiac output. There is one that is usually done in pulmonary function testing laboratories, what is called DLCO or diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide. Before we see carbon monoxide, this is to summarize what might happen to the rate of rise of oxygen in capillary blood. This is capillary oxygen, then dwell time in the pulmonary circulation changes. See this is the normal scenario, that is the normal dwell time, normal flow and normal diffusion. Then it may, it takes only about 0.25 seconds for capillary oxygen to reach alveolar oxygen levels. If flow is reduced, then it takes longer for a unit of blood to move out of pulmonary capillary. The dwell time in the pulmonary circulation for blood is longer and if even if diffusion is impaired, you notice that it may take longer for cap capillary oxygen to reach alveolar oxygen, but nevertheless it reaches that level. And if blood flow is much quicker, very high cardiac output conditions increased flow, even if diffusion is normal, you notice that there is not enough time for blood to increase its oxygen levels to match alveolar oxygen. Therefore, you will end up with a lower arterial oxygen and a higher alveolar arterial oxygen difference, even though diffusion is normal, just because flow has increased, you could have a higher alveolar oxygen gradient. Because of these phenomena, what I want to reiterate is that AaO2 difference is not the best test to assess diffusion impairment and the best test is DLCO. Reminding you again that DLCO is done when the patient is stable in the pulmonary function lab, whereas in the intensive care unit, the only tool available is alveolar arterial oxygen difference to assess diffusion impairment. A third limitation of AaO2 difference as a test of oxygen transfer is that it makes sense only when the patient is breathing room air. When a patient receives oxygen supplementation, the test of oxygenation status is PF ratio that is ratio of PaO2 to FiO2 which is fractional concentration of oxygen in inspired air. We will discuss PF ratio in a later lecture. Now, let us look at diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide. We know carbon monoxide is a poisonous gas. So, in this test a very tiny amount of carbon monoxide is mixed in the air that is inhaled and that is allowed to fill the alveolus. What we have here is alveolar carbon monoxide partial pressure. It is not 100, we are putting a very small concentration but I am just showing you what the maximum concentration could be here. Even if diffusion is normal, carbon monoxide transfer will occur 
throughout the time that blood dwells in the capillary because partial pressure of carbon monoxide and capillary blood will never increase to reach what is there in the alveolus. It can never happen because hemoglobin is a big sink for carbon monoxide. It has a much higher affinity for carbon monoxide than even for oxygen. Therefore, whatever carbon monoxide comes in is soaked up by hemoglobin and therefore, for the entire time that blood is in the capillary, carbon monoxide diffusion will continue and the amount of carbon monoxide, the content of carbon monoxide not just the dissolved carbon monoxide. Partial pressure of carbon monoxide will give us just the dissolved carbon monoxide. I am talking about carbon monoxide content which is what is dissolved plus what is there bound to hemoglobin. In fact, this is going to be negligible. So, if you estimate the content of carbon monoxide in arterial blood, it is going to tell you how much of carbon monoxide has actually come in uh, across the respiratory membrane. Now, why is this a better test? It is a better test because the amount of carbon monoxide in blood is dependent only on the diffusing capacity and not on rate of blood flow or perfusion. Therefore, carbon monoxide uptake is said to be diffusion limited. Now, let us see why we call this just diffusion limited and why is it not affected by blood flow? as happened for oxygen. Let, let us say normal flow conditions, low flow conditions and high flow conditions. In normal flow conditions, let us say in a given unit of time, that many red blood cells pass through the pulmonary capillary and they would have carried a certain amount of carbon monoxide in them. In low flow conditions, blood is flowing slower. So, there are fewer RBCs going through the pulmonary circulation, but they would have soaked up more carbon monoxide. Their ability to take up carbon monoxide is tremendous and RBCs or hemoglobin will never saturate with carbon monoxide for the levels that are administered during the test. So, it is going to carry more carbon monoxide per cell and when you estimate the total content, it is going to be equal to what is what was there in normal flow conditions. High flow conditions more because the speed of flow is higher, there are more RBCs traversing. Each one will go with a less amount of carbon monoxide, but the total amount of carbon monoxide in the blood that went out of the pulmonary capillary is going to be the same as this condition or this condition. Therefore, the amount of carbon monoxide which is taken up in blood every second is dependent only on the amount that is transferred across the respiratory membrane and not on the speed of blood flow. Therefore, transfer across the respiratory membrane being the only determinant of carbon monoxide content in arterial blood, it is a very sensitive test of diffusion impairment. If the total content of carbon monoxide carried is less than a normal value, I have not kept track of what the normal values are. If it is less, you know that there is diffusion impairment. So, we learnt about carbon monoxide diffusion because it is a lung function test. It assesses diffusion capacity of the lung. When textbooks discuss carbon monoxide transfer, they also discuss nitrous oxide transfer to highlight the difference between carbon monoxide and nitrous oxide. The concentration of dissolved carbon monoxide never increases in blood because hemoglobin is a huge sink for carbon monoxide. Let us take the case of nitrous oxide, hemoglobin does not take up nitrous oxide. Therefore, when blood, if you have nitrous oxide in the alveolus, when blood enters the capillary, the partial pressure of nitrous oxide in the alveolus which is the dissolved form quickly increases to reach alveolar levels because there is no sink. There is no other component in blood which will bind nitrous oxide. It rises quickly to reach the levels of alveolar nitrous, nitrous oxide and even if you have diffusion impairment, it may take a little longer 
but it will reach alveolar levels very quickly. So, the level of nitrous oxide or the content of nitrous oxide in arterial blood which is going to be just the dissolved nitrous oxide there is nothing in hemoglobin. This content will be the same whether there is diffusion impairment or not. The only factor which will affect this is how much of blood can flow across the capillaries per second. If more blood flows across the capillary every second then it can take out more nitri nitrous oxide. This is why textbooks will call nitrous oxide transfer as being perfusion limited and not diffusion limited. So, let me impress upon you that the discussion on nitrous oxide is purely academic. You need to know about diffusion of carbon monoxide because it is a lung function test. So, here let us review how the gas concentration or the dissolved gas concentration which is represented by the partial pressure of the gas changes in the capillary at a given rate of blood flow for nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide and oxygen. Nitrous oxide, dissolved nitrous oxide quickly reaches alveolar levels. I am not putting any one number on this. This will change to the alveolar gas concentration as it is for nitrous oxide, carbon monoxide or oxygen. So, the value in the capillary will quickly reach the alveolar level for nitrous oxide and if you estimate the content of nitrous oxide in the blood that is coming out that can change only with changing blood flow and therefore, we call it perfusion limited. In the case of carbon monoxide, the capillary concentration of carbon monoxide, dissolved carbon monoxide will never increase because it is going to keep going into hemoglobin, hemoglobin being a big sink for carbon monoxide. Therefore, we say carbon monoxide transfer is diffusion limited and is not affected by blood flow. How does oxygen behave? It is kind of midway. It takes a little longer for the dissolved oxygen concentration in the capillary to reach alveolar levels than nitrous oxide because hemoglobin is sucking up some oxygen, but it is much faster than carbon monoxide because the ability of hemoglobin to take up oxygen is less than its ability to take carbon monoxide. We should also remember that the partial pressure of oxygen in the alveolus is very high and the partial pressure of carbon monoxide in the alveolus is very low because we give a very low concentration of that gas in the gas mixture. That could be another reason why hemoglobin is not fully saturated with carbon monoxide because we keep the levels very low. So, since oxygen behavior is between nitrous oxide and carbon monoxide, oxygen transfer is both diffusion and perfusion limited. That is the amount that is found in arterial blood arterial oxygen content we have calculated this earlier is dependent on not only diffusion, but also on cardiac output. Okay. Now, all this confuses our concepts. Let us get back to our mnemonic and consider what we have just done in the context of our mnemonic. Okay. So, in the previous slide it was mentioned that oxygen transfer is both diffusion and perfusion limited, which means when there is diffusion Im impairment, total amount of oxygen transfer to arterial blood is less and therefore, arterial oxygen content is less. In perfusion impairment, the amount of blood flowing through the pulmonary circulation is less in a given time. Therefore, the amount of oxygen that can be carried in arterial blood is less in a given time. So, when textbooks discuss oxygen diffusion, they stop with saying that oxygen transfer is diffusion and perfusion limited. We should not forget that it is also ventilation limited. Ventilation is a very important determinant of oxygen transfer and that is what we saw here oxygen transfer is affected not only 
in diffusion impairment and perfusion impairment, but more importantly in ventilation impairment. We have not worried about ventilation in the context of carbon monoxide and nitrous oxide because those are experimental gases which are administered in the lab. Therefore, we did not worry about ventilation and we only wanted to differentiate oxygen from them uh, in terms of diffusion and perfusion only. We must not lose sight of the fact that ventilation is a very important determinant of oxygen transfer. Considering the other determinants, atmospheric hypoxia and anemia are also determinants of oxygen transfer. We must remember that in these conditions, dissolved oxygen concentration in the artery is low, that is what we call arterial hypoxia. Whereas, in these conditions, dissolved oxygen concentration in the artery can be normal. So, in the summary, we will consider oxygen transfer in the two paradigms that we have considered. The traditional one is in the context of fixed law of diffusion. Then we also had a mnemonic where we had causes of tissue hypoxia listed. So, ventilation impairment and atmospheric hypoxia which is oxygen concentration in inspired air will determine alveolar oxygen and therefore affect flux. Okay. So, these two affect alveolar oxygen and they are represented here. If, if perfusion is impaired, then capillary oxygen is not maintained at a low level and diffusion will stop earlier than otherwise. It affects the gradient because low perfusion fails to keep PCO2 low and that is why you get stagnant hypoxia. Diffusion membrane thickness and area, we studied it as the D of the mnemonic. I would like to introduce to you another concept, a very important concept which we will discuss in future lectures, what we call ventilation perfusion matching or the VQ ratio. We will learn about it and then understand that we could consider this as diffusion impairment. That is why I have shown it here. A change in hemoglobin concentration will again affect capillary oxygen. If hemoglobin is low, the sink for oxygen is less and oxygen in the capillary will rise too quickly, stopping diffusion earlier on. Therefore, the amount of oxygen carried will be less. That comes up here in our mnemonic. We also saw that alveolar arterial oxygen difference is a lung function test to assess diffusion impairment. It is the only test available in the intensive care unit, but we must remember that mild diffusion impairment may not be detected by this test and not just diffusion capacity, but also blood flow can affect that value. We must keep that in mind. And we saw that a better test of diffusion capacity is diffusion capacity of the lung for carbon monoxide because that parameter does not change with changing blood flow. We also learnt about nitrous oxide being perfusion limited, but let us not worry about it. You could choose to skip this idea of diffusion limitation, perfusion limitation, etcetera. Even without that, your concepts will be good at the bedside. Thank you for your attention.